blinking. Oh, is this too distracting for you? Too much microphone? You can't have things dangling in front of the pumpkin, right? You gonna get it? You gonna get it? I shouldn't let you play with it. Shouldn't be letting you do that, but you're so stinking cute. Okay, but it does have batteries, so not a good thing to play with. Hey, hey what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. It's a beautiful day. It's been raining for like a week, which we needed so, so badly. We've been in a severe drought. I figured because of all that rain, this would be a great time to get outside and do a garden tour. And it's the end of the month and it's time to do it. So this is, I, I had to do it now. <laughs> it's the only day where it's not supposed to rain for the rest of the week. So good timing to get out there. Fair night start inside. Cause y'all haven't seen the orchids in a while. Looking good. These have been in flower for a very long time. This one was labeled as a sesame, but it is not. This is not what a sesame looks like at all. I think this might be a Fiji spot perhaps, but I don't know. I don't know. That's just a guess. And then the other over here is a Fuller's Sunset, which just, that's a classic. If you want an orchid that holds onto its blooms for a long time and will likely rebloom maybe two or three times a year, I'd go with the Fuller's Sunset because you can find them just about anywhere. Here's what the flowers look like. Get a good look. You see those flowers? It's on a nice big plant with really big leaves. Might be a Fuller's Sunset. They're good bloomers. Remember the Picasso Spathophyllum I got last winter? Here it is. Doesn't that just look horrible? I don't even think it's a Picasso. I think it's just something someone in Thailand tossed in their microwave. Press the f you idiots button and here I am with my mutant Spathophyllum now. It needs a cut back. I've just been letting it throw out white foliage left and right, which we know we're not supposed to do. So I'm just cut it back. Maybe it'll start putting up some more desirable foliage. Things are looking good over here. Bryophytum. Looking good. That's about it for everything inside. We can go outside now. It just, I wanted to start in here because the view was nice. And I thought the flowers were looking good. Before I do, remember a couple months ago when I cut the cannas back because they were blocking the view of the window? I took pretty much everything from this point forward and pulled it out and said, I know it looks terrible, but it's going to fill back out. It did. And I can't see out the window again. That didn't take very long. Turbo, you want to go out? Let's go outside. Come on. It's a beautiful day. Let's go outside. Did I do the whole entire, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. I don't even remember. I hope I did. And all that stuff's true. Hope you're doing great. I haven't cleaned up. I like to pick up at least some before garden. Like I said, it's been raining. Today's the first day without rain. And I don't know why I, for some reason, been acting like that gets me out of cleaning up. I'll do some picking up. Just like with the last garden tour. Start off with a mess. Do a little bit of cleaning. And a lot of what we see is going to be a surprise to me, too, because I haven't been out here in over a week. Because, you know, rain. Didn't take you long, straight into the pool, huh? Isn't it beautiful out? This is going to be fun because I haven't seen anything in over a week. I mean, ish. I was just out here rolling up a hose and throwing a few things away. But for the most part, there's going to be some growth and hopefully some exciting things that I haven't seen before. So we'll be seeing it together. Not that much happens in one week, particularly this time of year, mid of summer. All kinds of stuff can happen. But right now... I don't know. It's just we don't really have the heat as much, so things aren't growing quite as much. It's that time of year right now where things are starting to lull out and uh, not look their best, but at the same time, some plants are just starting to peak, like the hepticodium. It's just covered in flowers. It should be for the next few weeks. That's why I like the hepticodium. Gives you something when everything else is starting to die off. Like For example, over here, those sweet potato vines this looks awesome. I think it's beautiful, but I'm also over it. Over it in the sense of it's just being, it's it's too much. It's being too much. You get it. You're a sweet potato vine. Stop eating the patio. I do love the color contrast that we got this year. I haven't planted up the front of the sun patients with anything in this spot in years. And last time I did, well, hold on. Actually, I should back up. I have, but it hasn't worked out well. So I have tried Tradescantia paletta, just the purple hearts, right in front of everything. They didn't do well. They would always fry and fizzle out when we'd have the really strong heat spells in the summertime. And I have tried wave petunias. They would do the same thing, rot out when it got really hot outside. But you know, sweet potato vines, they're just thug plants. They don't care at all. They just kept doing their thing. I've had to come in here about once a month with a pair of scissors and just cut them back. I skipped it this last month because I just figured I'd let them do their thing. That was partially because these sun patients that are in here, these are the uh, red candy, red candy, electric orange, and purple candy sun patients. They spread so much that they're about out to the edge of the patio. So it was getting to a point where if I cut the sweet potato vines back, then 
well, they wouldn't really even be in here. And I think it looks nice the way they're starting to blend together and flow together. I wouldn't want this long term, but you know, in about anywhere from two to four weeks, this is all going to be gone. That's the other thing. This is the last garden tour for the year, for the year with the palm trees, right? So all the big plants will be going off to storage here. I, the, I, what is it? The week of the 19th is when I schedule them. So they'll show up sometime at that point. The Gossia palms, which have been doing wonderfully, they're going to go. Giant queen palm, it's going to be gone. All the palms over here, except for the woodmill palm. So the double Adenidia over there, it'll be gone. Robolini, big queen. The Adenidia that I have no attachment to, so that's going to go. Speaking of this Adenidia over here, looks like the storm has knocked some things over. I'm probably going to end up doing some tidying and other things while we're out here as well, just because... Well, it's gonna bug me looking at things that aren't right. Oh, that got knocked over probably a couple days ago. Not looking too hot. But this Adenidia, I moved it over here into this corner just a couple of weeks ago. I think there were some bananas over here that were getting pretty big. And I thought that this would look better. And I do think that it does. Um, the problem is that the container this is in, which is a 25 gallon, had to go on top of one of the old banana stubs. And I cut that thing down just a little bit below the ground and it's coming back. I can see down here where the pot is starting to lift off, off of the ground. Do you see that? <laughs> the banana is starting to push the Adenidia, so it's getting crooked. I would do something about that, but I guess that we've only got a couple more weeks of this stuff going on out here, so I'm like, it's fine. It can be a little crooked for a couple weeks. And the big queen has grown maybe too much. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to fit that in their warehouse. I want to say this is taller than the one I had several years ago that I'd had for many, many years. And one year they said, uh, this isn't going to fit anymore and had to get rid of it. And this one is nowhere near as attractive. It's doing that bean pole thing that queen palms do sometimes where it isn't splaying out. It's just holding the foliage up straight in the air. And that's partially because there's not a ton of sun over here. It gets at least six hours of sun. But, you know, for a queen palm, they can go morning to night, just sun all day long. And it's, it's really, like, if, I don't know, if, can I get in the same shot? <laughs> the top of the fronds to the house. They're about probably a few feet higher than the gutters up there. So I don't, I don't know, I guess we'll find out. They'll come and take it and they'll let me know if it fits. If not, then I guess we'll have this palm tree next year. We'll see. I don't need to worry about all that right now. That's all stuff that I can think about in a few weeks it's done really well though that's the whole point it has been growing and growing and growing the thing just won't stop and that's what queen palms do that's why i say they make terrible house plants don't buy a queen palm to put in your house unless you got some place to put it in a few years outside or maybe you live someplace like i do where there's a company that will come and take them for you in the winter and throw them in a warehouse it was just a few years ago this queen palm and that one behind me were very small. I got this one, I want to say a year after I got the one behind me and they were in 15 gallon pots. I think they're maybe seven or eight feet tall, but you know, that's mostly just leaves when they're at that size. This one was a little bit bigger when I got it, but not much. And I do think it was still in a 15 gallon container. That was 2019, maybe spring of 2020. I think I'm not positive. That's just a few years ago. They really, they don't hold back on their growing. I'm going to have them take the little Adenidias that are down there, too. And, of course, the Alexander Palm. i say goodbye to the Alexander Palm. It did great this year. Lots of good growth out of the top. Still got some fried and nasty-looking stuff on the inside. Some crunchy foliage. That's from last winter. I just I kept forgetting that I need to buy a new true, true pruner. Tree pruner. And uh, that I, I needed to cut those things out. It'll self-clean. In a few months, it'll drop those old brown ones on their own it's been dropping all of its winter foliage on its own as it is but there's just like one or two left up there that have been bugging me and i just keep forgetting the tree printer i have the pole but the piece that goes on the end of the pole that you pull the string on that broke years ago and i just, just keep forgetting to buy a new one I need to do that so i can clean the palm trees up i really liked having the double trunked edinidia over here I can't believe it's already the end of the season when we're talking about this stuff. In the spring, when this was delivered, or really I think it was like June, these got delivered so late this year. I feel like they just got here. But I was debating whether or not to put this over here. Originally, this double trunk, there's another one over here, another trunk on it, has, that one's always been over here in between the two bamboo planters. 
and the Edenidia that I used to keep here didn't make it through the winter last year. So I had a decision to make, which was to move this one over here, which clearly it's what I did, or use that single trunk that I just showed you that was just a, it's a, I don't know, I'm not crazy about that palm tree. It's a little scrawny thing. That didn't work in this spot. I mean, it would just smack you in the face when you walk through this doorway here. I put this over here and I absolutely love it. And the palm tree seems to really like this spot too. So look at all the growth. This thing's just been growing like insanity up here. I have been fertilizing, though for the month of September, I pretty much backed off of that completely just because that drought and the dry air and everything and time, September was a very busy month. And I'm like, you know, I've been fertilizing every time I water with a diluted ratio of fertilizer. And then they've been getting slow release and the perfect palm fertilizer every single month. So I was like, I think that it's probably fine to back off of it and leave them alone. And they're still growing and still looking great. The only thing that I think probably would have benefited more from staying on top of the fertilizing would have been the dichondra because these were, they're still growing very well, but they were really putting out a lot of growth when they were getting hit with the fertilizer. But you yeah, know, you just don't always have time for it. And they're big enough. They, these don't need to be bigger. Gonna be sad to see them go. I really like having the palms out here, but I also, do get to enjoy the process of rearranging things. I think that that's a lot of fun. Once all these are gone, windmill palm will still be here and I will move that over to where the Adenidia palm is and that'll be out here for the majority of the year. I move it in when it gets really cold or if we're going to have an ice storm, something like that. By really cold, I mean under 20 Fahrenheit just to take care of it. They can go colder than that, but it's in a pot so it's more exposed and everything. I suppose since it's going to be closer to the house that maybe I could construct something to wrap around it. I might do that. I did that with the bamboo last year and those planters never dropped below 19 degrees when I had heat cables wrapped around the bottom of the pot and they were double bagged. But uh, I don't know, this thing, it's pretty big. It's gonna be hard to double bag a windmill palm that big. Uh, you get the point. And then I have the mule palms out here too. So there's still gonna be palm trees out here. And then I have a second rotation of plants I've talked about that in other videos, plants that look cold hardy, but aren't necessarily, or I should say, no, plants that look tropical, but aren't cold hardy. So that's the shaky camera stuff there. There's a spider crawling on my finger. I have the, like the recurvifolia yuccas and things that have a monopodial growth habit to them and the needle palms that they've gotten huge. Look how big these needle palms have gotten. This has been their year to shine. I haven't done anything different with them other than use the perfect palm fertilizer. I have not been hand watering these they get hit by the irrigation. Hand watering them would I mean, probably be fine, but these have been in the ground so long that I think that that would just be uh, uh, something that uh, it, they don't need it. <laughs> They're established. It was gonna say it'd be a waste of time. It wouldn't, since the water, my hose is hooked up to fertigation. I'm sure they would benefit from getting that fertilizer, but uh, I haven't been doing that. They've gotten one liquid fertilizer in the late spring, early summer, and otherwise it's all been slow release since then. And they're just huge. You know I'm impressed with them because these are plants that I typically just forget about <laughs> in all the garden tours. But I think the last couple, I've been able to talk about them because they're standing out to me. They're taller than me now. At least this one is. That one over there is a little bit shorter. But this one, it's easily, I'd say probably 6'3". It's mounted up. This is a berm, so it's probably more like, I don't know, 5'10", maybe. But it's still really big and happy. I'm impressed with that perfect palm fertilizer so far for the larger palms. The smaller palms, I'm not sure how much benefit it's done for them. Over here, backing up, this is all new. This wasn't in the last garden tour. And pardon the, there's a pool, the filter, it's loud. Can't do anything about that, gotta keep it on. Well, I, I, I could turn it off. Would it, no, actually, I'm not gonna do that, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to my uncaffeinated brain. Not turning it off because uh, it wears on the pump turning it on and off and sometimes it doesn't wanna turn back on. I just don't feel like dealing with that kind of a headache. This is the new shade garden. So in the last garden tour, for those of you who only pop in for the garden tours, I had just gotten this cleaned up and outlined and I think mulched. The uh, Limelight Prime Hydrangea was already over here. The K Paris or Paris K, I can't remember which. Magnolia was back there. But just about everything else over here is new, except for this Typhonium Gigantium right there and the Acanthus. Planted up all kinds of fun stuff. Have some May apples back here. These were from a Plant Delights haul. I tried to keep their tags nearby. This one's called Too Tall, I think, or Standing Tall, Podophyllum. Is that it? Yeah, Standing Tall. This will get real big next year. It's supposed to be about 43 inches high. It's put up a few new leaves, not much, 
it's only been in the ground for a couple weeks, so I'm not mad about that. And then I have the Rhodia Japonica over here, which just has these really nice long blades of green, thick, glossy foliage. Long-lived, beautiful shade plant that'll make a nice little clump over there underneath the tree. We're just filming right into my shadow, huh? Try another angle, but you'll see the back of the barbecue grow. Saxifraga. This is a fun one. This one gets big as far as Saxifragas go. It's called the Nezu Jinji. Jinji? I, it's worn off. It's a begonia. Strawberry begonia. Well, it's not actually begonia. <laughs> the common name is strawberry begonia. Evergreen. Thinks these are hardy all the way to zone three, maybe four. And this particular one is supposed to get really big four inch wide leaves on them. So it'll be a nice patch here of that nice light green with that minty green variegation in the middle. Big leaves. Nice broad evergreen leaves. It's hard to find that for 6B, 7A. Not a lot of options. This one right here is just now opening up a new leaf, which is great. It's not a very big one, but that means it's starting to settle down and put its roots down. This is the Diform Podophyllum. These have awesome leaves on them. It's not showing them yet. That's probably something we're gonna have to wait for it next year, but the leaves on these are gonna be more of a greenish purple with a bronze overlay on it. It's really hard to describe it. It almost looks like there's um, like somebody sprinkled a metallic purple and bronze paint over an aqua leaf. They, they're just gorgeous. But again, I have to wait till next year to really get to see much from that. The, uh, who are, what are these? Hakanakloas. Hakanakloa and some Aserum ginger over here. That's what I wanted to have fill out this spot. It's hard to tell, but there is a slope right here. It's not a very dramatic slope. It's very gentle. I would like to at some point come through here. You can already see where the lawn is starting to creep up onto this new berm area. I'd like to come through at some point and uh, build this up and put a retaining wall, you know, just a couple bricks high right there to help separate things out. But, you know, just getting going in this area. And this is, you know, I guess the first draft. We'll call it the first draft. Anyways, put these Hakanakloa in here. There are five of them. I know it doesn't look like they're spaced evenly. <laughs> evenly? Forgot how to talk. You know what I'm saying. That's because the one right here in the middle is a smaller size than the rest of them. But next year, these should bush out and fill out, and it'll just look like a wave of that really pretty, graceful grass flowing onto itself and then slightly over the slope. That I know it's hard to see the slope, but believe me, it's there. In person, you can see the slope. They've started growing since so they were just planted a few weeks ago. Not much to it. This time of year, I don't expect to see much growth. It's more about getting the roots established. So I talked about that in the root stimulator video where I just want to get them in the ground and get their roots to spread out. Next year is when I'm really hoping to see some actions. One of the fun things about planting in fall, you plant in the fall, don't expect to see much, but you are off to the races a lot faster the following year when spring hits and things start to emerge. They've already somewhat set out some root and they're ready to go as opposed to planting up in the springtime. And it's good to plant in the fall too because the ground's nice and warm, the air's more cool, so the plants can take in water and hold on to it without it being blown right out of them. They just tend to establish really well. Not all plants. They need to be plants that are hardy to your zone. So if you're uh, trying to plant, say, I don't know, maybe a crepe myrtle or a needle palm in a zone that you don't live in. So let's say they do best in zone seven where they're like foolproof. Maybe you're in zone 5B, then I would plant those up early spring, give them all year to put out their roots. But for things that are fully hardy to your zone, you, we're just going to walk right through it, huh? You don't even, don't even care. That's fine. He's a dog. I was expecting that. I him off earlier. That was the whole point. So I'm happy with how these things are coming out. I wanted to get them in the ground this fall so that there's some stuff to look forward to in the spring. There's a mixture of evergreens and deciduous plants over here. The acerum right here, this beautiful ginger. Isn't that just gorgeous? Look at the foliage. It's so shiny and glossy, and there are tons of different cold hardy acerums to choose from. Well, they're all, almost all more cold hardy. There's a, it's just a regular acerum splendens. But there are some really cool cultivars that have even more interesting foliage on them. And uh, I am using this as just my judgment plant, <laughs> my trial plant. See how it does this year through the winter in this spot. And if it does well, then I will try and find some of those ones that are more exotic and crazy looking. Although I do think that just the regular looks really neat. It doesn't really need to be improved, but there are some fun ones to plant out. And I might give those a try. The Royal Fern back here. It has been very mad at me since I planted it. I'm not shocked by because it was very hot outside, but there's some green 
coming up down there in the middle. This might be one of those plants where it's just going to be pissed at me this year and hopefully next year it'll start looking better. Can I say pissed on YouTube? I hope so. I feel like I've said it plenty of times. It should be fine. Same thing over here with the <laughs> Korean rock fern. It was very mad at me because, you know, we had that drought, but I had to get them planted. Their odds were better in the ground than sitting around in containers waiting to be planted. So it uh, threw a fit for a pretty long time, but it is now starting to look like it's got some settles in the middle ready to come up. So that's good. That's supposed to be evergreen. It'll be semi evergreen here. I don't know. Where are the other evergreens? It's mainly the saxifraga, the ginger, the rhodia, and the fern. So I kind of got a little triangle going on in here of some evergreen ground cover and everything else is dieback, not the magnolia. Right, that's gonna stay evergreen, but everything else will be deciduous. Ooh, the toad lily. I'm really glad that this is blooming. Look at that. Look, can you see it? Get in real close. Tell me that that is not a freaking awesome flower. Isn't that just stunning? I love a toad lily and I am so happy that I got this planted up. This one's called Gilt's Edge. And look at the variegation on it. It's just an absolutely beautiful plant. These tend to be pretty prolific. So next year I would imagine this will be at least 40, 50% larger than this. And they bloom later in the season than a lot of other plants do, which is nice because you get a show when everything else is lulling out, not looking great. Gosh, that's so pretty. Really, really glad that was in bloom for the garden tour. The acanthus. So I planted up a whole bunch of these oak leaf acanthus this spring, spread them all over the garden. And uh, I did that to see what spots they were going to do their best in because acanthus mollusks can be hit or miss here. And uh, they are doing wonderfully. They looked pretty cruddy for the majority of the year this one and the one that I'll show you next. But over the last few weeks, since the temperatures have cooled off and now they've had a week of rain growing very nicely, they put out a lot of foliage. I almost lost this one completely. It had died back to maybe just one or two leaves, but this is what I've got out of it now. And in a bit, we'll go to the other side of the garden and I can show you the larger one I planted. How do I explain this? <laughs> I got them in different sizes, mostly one and three gallon containers. Man, I think, yeah, I think that's right. Might've been two and a half. Monrovia does their pot sizes a little bit different, but I think they're all number two containers. Then I got one that was a number five and it cost a lot more than the rest, but I wanted to see the size difference. Kind of like in the video that came up prior to this one. So you can see the cost difference between the little ones that you get for, you know, X amount of dollars versus the big ones. And is it worth it? It's gonna vary from plant to plant, right? So you'll see here in a little bit the size difference with what I've managed to get out of the, uh, like I said, probably number two size Monrovia Acanthus versus the number five, which have gotten huge. I uh, think that it will do well over here in this area. Hopefully it'll come back next year. That's always the main thing is getting them through the heat of the summer and then through winter. It should be okay because I'm going to be putting some mulch over here. I think it'll do all right, but you just never know. But imagine when this is about three times that size, just those great big glossy green leaves with a long, tall spire of flowers on them. That's gonna be so pretty. Very happy with the shade garden. Some other plants, hibiscus and things, they've been doing well, but that drought, you know, it just, it really sucked the life out of a lot of these guys because I can only water so much, even with the drip and everything, it just wasn't cutting it for some of them. Nothing died, but, they just weren't thriving, right? So instead of having that, what, like eight weeks, I think is how long that drought went on. Eight weeks, yeah, where they would have been growing and said they were just surviving. Not ideal, but it happens. Some things did grow, though. Now look at these sun patients. They look great. These, you know, I think in the last garden tour, they had just been planted up. I had redone these containers completely, this one and the one over here, which is now kind of hidden by everything that's growing over it. But I put the Pakistakis Ludias in here with the, I think these are just hot pink sun patients. That might've been what they're hot, they're not hot coral. I think they're just hot pink. Those have filled out very nicely, but I wasn't sure if that was going to be the case <laughs> with all that heat and lack of rain. We said still watering and everything, but still you're talking triple digit temperatures and one day of rain in eight weeks. It's just not enough for some of them. You start to get some really interesting growth on things. Are you about to flower? That'd be fun. 
I don't always get to see the Lismachias do much as far as flowering goes when I have them in the containers. Now that has done well. The Lismachias that I put in the front of these, look at that. Gigantic. I wouldn't expect any less. Those are usually my gauge for how well things are being watered. So you can tell it's been well hydrated. It's just when the air's that hot, plants aren't doing much. They're just barely getting by. And despite that, still gotten some really nice full growth out of these pack of stackies. I don't know if you remember when I planted these things up, they were just stringy, scrawny. They did not look great. They'd been sitting out in the full sun at a nursery. And I think they were just in maybe four inch containers being sold as annuals. Okay, I just, that was, I didn't mean to do that. Oops, happens sometimes. It was loose, it's, it's not my fault. It was gonna come off anyways, probably the next time there's a strong breeze. But yeah, it's like, they've done great, haven't they? In spite of all that drought, they're looking really nice. I like the color pairing with just the pink and the yellow. It's more simple and calm than how it was with all the begonias and the caladiums. And it just, it hurt my brain to look over here. So I'm really glad that I redid these. <laughs> It'd be even more glad. If I, I had to move some things around. Typically the front of this wall was open, but I had to do some scooting and moving things to get, have some access to do some stuff I'm working on over here under the ground, trying to get some old pipes removed. But when those aren't right here, this looks really great. When it's nice and open, you can see the pink with all the pack of stackies and everything. You get it. You get it. I need to turn the brain off for a second, take a break and reboot. Yeah, just overall really happy with how things turned out. It's not that normal for me to go through and tear apart planters and start over mid-season, but I'm glad that I did because I just think that that looks so much better over here the way it is. The rest of the plants, they're just growing. Not a ton because of that drought. I'm beating that topic too much. But you get it, right? I don't need to keep going about that. There is still enough growth, though, to be happy. Like the freckles, croton, this got repotted in the springtime. He's been doing great over here. Gotten real big. The foliage is still not what it's supposed to be on. Or freckles, they're supposed to be shorter and rounder. So I'm thinking that when I move this into the grow space, I'm probably gonna cut this back by like 50, maybe even 75%, just really cut it all the way back so that whatever may have reverted will go back to normal. That's the hope anyways, because this is not the freckles that I fell in love with, but it still has the temperament. It's been a very sturdy, very forgiving croton that doesn't normally have any pest problems. I think there may have been a few mealybugs on it last year, but nothing too terrible. Been a pretty sturdy plant. Look at how much it's filled out. It's gotten real big. This is a chair that it's sitting right in front of. That chair is, I want to say 24 inches wide. So it's probably about three feet across. More than likely it's sitting in there at an angle. The Persian shields, I'm debating whether or not I'm going to move them in for the winter time. They're so easy to overwinter, so it would make sense to move them in. But is it really necessary when there's something I can pick up as an annual every year for like four bucks? You know, time and space are really valuable <laughs> in the grow space. So I don't want to move too much in. I would like to have some space this year in the grow space this winter for production and plants that I have a harder time getting a hold of. So I want to have some, some space for cuttings. <laughs> Mouth stopped working there while I was talking, and uh, potentially all the heliconias. I may try and move those in as well, or at least some of them. I've always taken the hirsutas, that will go in. But the chaconianas, which are these on each side of the steps, they're not always that easy to get a hold of, and I'm not very happy with the company that I order them from, I, which I believe was Nature's Hills, but don't, don't quote, I'm not like going after them or anything. But you know, I placed an order for a few more a few months ago, never got them. So I'm not all that inclined to want to order more from them next year. And I emailed them and they just said that it's been too hot. I'm like, so what, you haven't been shipping plants all summer? How's that working out for you as an online plant seller? I just, I don't, I don't buy it. And they said that they could cancel the order if there'd be a 20% restocking fee. And so I've just been kind of letting that boil over in my mind as to how to move forward and handle that because I'm not going to pay a 20% restocking fee when clearly I think they just forgot about my order. And at this point, if they ship them out, it's too late. It's going to be too cold in a few weeks to have the heliconias out here. So that's why I'm thinking I want to try and bring some of them in. The thing is, I just hate, <laughs> I hate overwintering heliconias inside. I have a strawberries and cream that one of y'all sent me that overwintered wonderfully in the grow space, but it was a mealybug magnet 
So I had to get rid of it. It was just constantly infested. I couldn't get the mealybugs off of it. It would likely be the same thing with these when I move them in. So uh, it's just something to think about. Point there though is that they have done very well. It's been a good year for the Heliconias. I think that they really enjoyed the fertigation system. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably looking kind of gross right now because I haven't used it in a few weeks. But I attached a Chapin fertilizer injector to the hose over here. So you put your fertilizer in this basket right here and it distributes it at an ounce per gallon. So whenever I water through this orange hose, everything gets a little bit of fertilizer. Not a lot, but enough. And they've stayed nice and green. Heck, I didn't even repot them. Usually my heliconias, I repot them every year. They're still in their nursery containers. And the one that's over here in the shade has a good amount of growth on it, but it's still flowering. That's a good sign of a really nice, happy, healthy heliconia because sometimes if they're not getting the right light, they're not gonna bloom, they're just gonna stretch out. The Chaconianas, Andromedas, a lot of the Ceterocorum types, which are these parrot speak heliconias, the flowers look similar to this, but come in various sizes and colors, but it's a similar shape and growth habit. They tend to be ones that will bloom pretty prolifically as long as they're getting enough light. And you can see these over here, they get tons of sun. They have more squat growth, but the foliage is still nice and green. Whereas the one that's back here, the foliage is more stretched out because it's less light, shaded over here by the Robolini palm, but still blooming. And I attribute that to the fertilizer. It's the only thing I can think of. Normally, when I have the heliconias over here, this time of year, they start to really lull out and they're not looking too hot. But this has just been doing great in this spot. It keeps growing. Same thing for the tea plants back here. The Cordoan Fredicasas, these are the Harlequins. Got a lot of growth out of these. Look how big they've gotten. These were, I don't know, probably maybe down here when I picked them up in the springtime. So a good foot, foot and a half of growth on them. Not as much color as I like to see on them, but that's because they're getting more shade now. And that's okay because it was so hot and so dry. I wouldn't want these in the blazing sun. They shouldn't be in the blazing sun anyway. And you have really hot temperatures, right? Triple digit temps, they don't want full sun. So you can see the light that they're getting. It's dappled and that affects the color and temperatures do too. I would imagine in a couple weeks, these will start to get some more color on them. So the tea plants, the cordon fruticasas and the heliconias are the ones where I'm the most on the fence about what I'm going to do is overwintering them because it's a similar situation. They like things warm and humid, a good amount of light, and both of them just end up covered in pests when I bring them inside. I spray everything down. I have a whole process and a monthly process once everything's inside. Last year it was every two weeks. And still, I always end up getting rid of the cordolins about halfway through the winter because I just can't take it anymore. It's difficult. I think that's the problem is that it's difficult to really get inside all the nooks and crannies on the cordolins to make sure you've gotten everything, especially because I have a pond in the growth space and there's fish in there. So I have to be very careful with my sprays. So I don't know, it's something to think about. Only talking about that now because I would imagine by the next garden tour, these probably won't be out here. So typically in October, we usually have a few random, very, very, very cold days where I have to rush the tropicals inside and then things get mild and it'll be very nice out until like mid-December. But you know, it's just always, it's just a few random days, sometime between mid-October and mid-November that makes it so the plants have to go in and lose some growing time, but that's okay. What's nice about that is you still end up with some really nice weather to work with to get things cleaned up outside and reestablish the planters, do new things to carry through the second part of the year, the off season, right? So these Gossia palms, when those are gone in a few weeks, I have the Spring Grove Arborbite, Arborvites, <laughs> that's where they're called. They're down there on that end, you can't see them. But those go in these containers, so there's something evergreen out here during the winter time. Hydrangeas will still be there. And I have some, what are, it's not sugar and spice. I can't remember the name of it. You'll see it in a few weeks when I do it, but in the Miami planters, which is what these Adenidia palms are in, down here by the dolphins, there's just a couple of junipers that go in there. Just nice to have some evergreens out here, which has had me thinking about something. Every year I try to incorporate more evergreens into the garden. This year, focus a lot on shrubbery, so I planted a lot of yews, which I'll show you later. They're not really where we can see them right now. But once everything's gone and the foliage has come off of the plants, they'll be more noticeable. And I'll be happy about that for the second part of the year. But on that note of just moving things around and making some changes, I've been thinking about maybe ditching the Adenidia palm by ditching, telling the people who store the palm trees to just keep it because I'm, just, I'm not crazy about it. It's taking up space. And maybe moving 
this areca palm into a nursery container right now <laughs> you can't tell but it's in a very large what actually my favorite containers i have out here these aqua ripple planters from labu labu i don't know how you say it really common pottery company they stopped making those i don't know i haven't seen them in a nursery since like 2010 so i really like those planters i hate moving this palm tree around because i'm always worried that i'm going to break it i would be devastated if i broke that container the bigger this gets the more risky it is to move it around and by moving this into a nursery container it'd be just a little bit shorter not about much maybe six inches shorter and then it would fit better into the grow space because the, i don't store this one i just move it into the garage the eureka palms it overwinters so wonderfully in the garage that i'm not going to pay somebody else to take care of it but it has reached a height where the tops of the trunks are smashing against the ceiling it's such a sturdy plant it doesn't seem to mind but it would be better if it just had a few inches less in that container so be a little bit shorter and then maybe having that areca palm over there in that corner and i think that would be really pretty having that beautiful golden yellow and then the white up against the side of the house and that graceful arching habit from all the stems i think it would look really good over there in that spot but i also think that i will be fighting with myself over this decision which isn't a decision i need to make until next year i could make it this year but it could wait till next year because this has always been here there used to be two of them and that maple tree got really big and shaded the one that was over there and i don't know like several years ago the other one just started to wither away it wasn't looking good anymore but it'd be nice to have the symmetry back over here so uh, while it would drive me nuts because just change right that's a big change this is a very big dramatic plant don't know how well you can tell on camera but it is quite large it is a very big palm and it would be odd not having it right there but if i were to do this thing that i'm talking about and move this over there then uh, i would have the two matching ripple planters which you can't see right now but they're there to be able to see them very well by probably like mid-october through may when I start to put the annuals out and maybe doing junipers in those, which I know isn't very exciting, but it would be something evergreen. So we'd have the year round interest out here and there'd be symmetry on each side over here, which would be nice. Cause as is right now, as it, that was just a weird jumble of sounds as it is right now, I have a hibiscus over here and next year, maybe I'll have the hibiscus there. Who knows? You know, I just play around with what to put on the other side. But when you have something like this, where you have the two planters that match right there, I just think it would look better to have something that matches, right? I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. This is the last time I'm gonna be out here with the palm trees, right? Where I can just stand around and talk about them. For the most part, usually the other videos I'm doing something or talking about a specific topic. So the garden tour seems like the appropriate time to put these ideas out there and see what everybody else thinks. I think it would look awesome having the Eureka palm over there, but I also think that it would, it's just gonna feel really weird not having it in this spot. I'd get another one, but I don't see them for sale that often anymore. I don't know why. They're very common palm trees. And, okay, well, hold on. Back it up. I do see them for sale, but usually in a 10-inch pot for like $60 or $70. And they're, you know, this big. I would need something in a 20 or 25-gallon container that has some nice size trunks on them. And I have seen them occasionally in that size, but they don't have the nice trunks on them. They're still years behind this one. This one, it's got lots and lots and lots of rings on those trunks. So, yeah. We'll see. Something to think about. It's just, this thing looks so good right here, though. In the ideal world, I'd just get another one, right? That's something to think about. I'll keep my eyes peeled. Maybe send a picture to my palm tree dealer and just get another one to put over there in that spot. Although I don't really, I don't have room in the grow space for two of these things. That's something else I have to think about. That all goes, tie him back to wanting to have some plants that I can store and potentially propagate and needing space. The space is valuable. So I have to think long and hard about what goes into the grow space. Everything else out here, I can't say everything else. I've barely covered like 25% of the garden. I need to get a little bit more on point with what I'm talking about. The plants have been doing well. The blizzard alocasia, I finally moved it. And one of the last garden tours, I talked about how it was over there, it was over there by the bamboo planters. And it was leaning and just stretching. It looked kind of funny. Like clearly it wanted some more sun. So I moved it to the opposite side of the patio and turned it so it would straighten itself out. And it straightened itself out for the most part. I don't know if this is an alocasia that's supposed to get some size on it. I have seen pictures of them where they look really big. This one is vigorous, but it hasn't been putting on a lot of height. 
it's spreading out really well, but I'm not getting height out of it. And sometimes that happens in containers. With alocasia, sometimes you need to get them to a size about like this, and then go ahead and plant them out into the ground or slightly overpot them when it's nice and warm outside and they have lots of time to establish themselves. It's too late to do this now. But then they'll fill out that container and you start to get some more size out of them. Like this lutea, which is currently only in a 10 gallon pot. That's my fault. I was supposed to repot it and I totally forgot to do that. But had I bumped this up into a 15 gallon container, this would obviously, it'd be bigger, right? You move your plant to a bigger pot and it gets bigger. This was just in a six inch pot in the spring. So I moved it to a 10 inch container. And I think that it established itself very, very, very well in there, very quickly. It only took a couple of months, but I think it's too late to go ahead and move it into something bigger. It just seems risky to do that this time of year. Really well in the grow space, so I don't think it's something I have to worry about. It should be fine hanging out this winter. And speaking of things that have been doing well, look at this dichondra. Look at that. Look at it. It's ridiculous. These things are freaking huge. Probably, I'd say, seven feet, I'm guessing something along those lines, I will definitely be doing this again next year. Now, I didn't do these. I bought them. The 16 bucks, that's a great deal. I wouldn't have been able to put that together myself. I don't usually like to do a hanging basket myself if I'm going to be saving some money. But with these, $16, they're on sale, and they're already pretty big. I want to say they were probably about 30 inches when I got them. They've maybe doubled in size. Well, they've more than doubled in size. They've just done really, really well. I especially like the way they look over here. Over here, the colors... Over here, there's a good complementary color thing going on here with the creamy orange in the Tahitian flame. Maybe Fiesta, I'm not positive, Hidikium against that silvery foliage with the pretty, I want to say Berry Tattoo Vinca. Might be that one, I'm not sure. Wasn't labeled, so I don't want to say anything with certainty. But I like that color pairing. I think they look really nice together. The Hidikium that's over here, I'm probably going to be taking that out next year because it's just... It's too big. You can't get through the door. But I wanted to leave it for now and just let it bloom and get to enjoy it. It looks good. I'm really happy with the flowers on it, so I couldn't bring myself to cut it back. But it will be nice when this is opened up again. Because, uh, yeah, well, you can see it's hard to get through the door. The passion vine, which is all the way over here, growing up into the palm tree, planted that in the springtime right back here. It's going to be hard to see it, but down there. And I put these trellis on the walls. And it has been happy. <laughs> it's doing a ton of growing. It's all the way up there. You can't see it, but it is. It's behind the palm tree. You can see it dangling down in there, all the way over there. Gotten a lot of growth out of it. I even see one popping up over here somehow. I'm not really sure how, but there is one popping up over here in the ground. Uh, no flowers, which is bizarre. I've never had a passion flower not flower for me. But I just assume that the dichondra is shading it too much. That's the only thing I can figure. So it's definitely growing, but it is stretched out growth. I don't have a spot I can put it that gets more sun than this, so I'm just hoping that next year it will get off and get moving more quickly. And uh, like it'll have time to do what it needs to do <laughs> to prepare to flower before the hanging baskets go up. I did put these hanging baskets on adjustable brackets, so all I have to do is kind of lift up the hanger that's in there and give it a little turn and I can bring this out further. So next year, instead of having the center between the window and the door, I may just have this basket hanging directly in front of the window and that'll let more light in there. I don't know. I'm just happy that it's been growing and doing well. The main thing is actually getting it to overwinter. It's just a cerulea, which is typically hardy into zone seven and zone six with proper siding and mulching. And uh, I, I think this is a good spot for it to overwinter it. Just have to remember to throw some mulch on top of it and it should come back next year. If not, try again. Oh, here's a plant. Here's a plant I'm excited to update about. This is the Hedicium Tahitian Flame, my favorite of the Hedicium's. It has such beautiful foliage. Look at those leaves. It's got various colors of green and cream on the inside. It's just stunning. So much color inside this Hedicium, and for the first time, it's flowering, and I love this flower. It's a squat inflorescence with orange on the outside when you're looking at it. I don't know how much you need to describe it. You can see it. And a white to peach flower on the inside. And even, look at that, look at all the variegation that's in there on the inflorescence itself. Excellent plant. This is one that I am trying to grow off and get a good size on the rhizome. I'm gonna cut that rhizome in half and stick some in the ground. I have gotten them to overwinter here before, 
but the growth I've been getting out of them when they survived the winter just hasn't been substantial. And I think it's because I've been using just little, little tiny eyes essentially off of the rhizome. I think I need to grow them with a nice big chunk and get a big established plant into the ground and hopefully we'll have more vigor out of them. The problem is they're just not that easy to come by. It's not what I would call a rare plant. I guess it is rare in the sense that I don't see them for sale very often, but they used to be mass produced. Right? I think these were sold by Terra Nova. I think I've talked about that before. And occasionally I see them on Etsy, people selling like tiny little offsets and divisions from the plants. But it's just one where I feel better personally overwintering it in the grow space because it's just one of those things where if it does die in the winter time, I might not be able to replace it. And then if I do replace it, it might just be a teeny tiny itty bitty little plant that I'm gonna have to wait for years for them to get to this size. This was very small when it got repotted in the springtime. That was in a video. And it has completely filled out that container, really should be moved up into a larger container, but it, I just feel like it's too late. It didn't really fill this out until a few weeks ago, and I don't know if I wanna go bumping this up into a bigger pot when the seasons are changing, right? That things are gonna start to get cooler, and we're only about a month away from when this will start to move into a dormancy. I should probably just leave it, but I would like to get more growth out of it. I want to just, I just wish we had like two more months, just two more months of growth it would be really great, but we don't, that's not the way things work. Fall is fall, it's happening. I can't fight it, just need to embrace it, be prepared for it. Some agaves, aren't these beautiful? These are, what are they, Galactic Traveler, I believe is the name on this one. It's a Desmontiana, and yeah, Galactic Traveler. I was looking, there's a tag over here. Got these from Plant Delights. They were looking pretty shabby when they showed up. Uh, just, you know heat and everything and shipping. They're filling out wonderfully, looking pretty good. The orchid arrangement is just now starting to fizzle out. And uh, the orchid, the, 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 it, it, was, it was too hot. Look at that. Look at what happened to those poor orchids. But you know, triple digit temperatures and no rain. They were only getting filtered light, but it doesn't take much to scorch an orchid. The flowers themselves held up though for, what has it been? Six weeks until they started to fizzle out. That's not bad. Not bad at all. And as far as the foliage goes, you know, they're Phalaenopsis, no big deal. <laughs> They'll look great in just a few months. No, that was sarcasm. They're slow to grow, but it is what it is. What's happened's happened. Windmill palm, this has been enjoying its new container. Getting lots of new growth out of it. I don't need to focus on that one too much because windmill palm will be getting a lot of attention when the more tropical palms are gone. Over here, I have a whole bunch of new stuff. So these are plants that I think they will have been in the video prior to this one. All from Southern Living. These are plants that are a mixture of things that I want to use for the winter time and some things I just want to get into the ground. So these are the, uh, I'm going to call them Everrio because I assume they're going off of Amarillo. So what I call them Everrio, it'd be Everrio, right? Amarillo is the color though. Whatever. It's a beautiful Carex. Semi evergreen, hardy to zone six. Actually, I think zone five. Beautiful foliage. I'm going to use those to line some containers, edge some garden beds, and add some semi-evergreen color around here in the shade. New fig. There's really no updates to give with these. If you watched the video prior to this one, it's only been a few days since these showed up. Uh, but the plant I was the most excited about is the Diamond Spire Gardenia. Look at those leaves. You gotta love a plant that you buy for the flowers, but you still just love it even when it's not in flower, right? So much character. They're almost like little... Ficus laratas, potentially like the bambino, the rounder, more chunky leaves on them. Each leaf, they look like little teddy bear ears. Really like the shape on that one. So that's a gardenia that's going to grow up into more of a column instead of being more of a rounded, mounded bush. And they're supposed to bloom intermittently during the summer. They'll bloom some in the spring off of their buds from the prior year, which that's just how gardenias work, right? So you have to maintain the buds. That's why you can't let them get too cold during the winter time. It's a zone seven to 10. I'll be moving it inside drops below 20. And then uh, they'll have a lull in the summer where they focus more on growth and then they'll start to bloom again mid to late summer and should continue into the fall. Another orchid got a little bit too much light over here. That's okay though. This is the sesame. So that orchid that was inside at the beginning of the video and I said, I don't think that's a sesame. That's because this is what a sesame looks like. And even this one for a sesame looks kind of off. I've seen a lot of the sesames before. These just, I don't know, they don't look quite right. There's something just different about them. It's disappointing, right? That's just the way things go sometimes with plants. 
when things are being tissue cultured, they start to look weird. I was going to show you something over here, but I don't remember what it was. Oh, the variegated, variegated, variegated leucocasias. Not much has happened with them, but considering they were just tiny little sticks when I put them in the ground, they're looking pretty good. Interesting leaves. Not a plant my mind is blown with, but they also haven't grown that much. That's probably something where I'm going to have to wait until next year to really decide how much I like them. They need to get some more size on them first. Oh, you know what I just realized is going to be interesting? Is that in a few weeks, this Edenidia palm is going to be gone. All those palms, I've said this a few times. And then I'm going to want to move that windmill palm over there into that corner. But to get it in that spot, you have to lay the, it's, it's tricky. The palms have to go kind of on their side and you have to wiggle them in there and then tilt them up. And that windmill palm was just repotted like two months ago. If I lay that thing on its side, it might completely mess up everything it's done as far as rooting into that container. That, well, that's something I'm gonna have to think about. I don't need to think about that right now though. Don't know why I decided to bring that up now. It was just something that crossed my mind. As far as, like I was saying before about needing to make room for plants in the grow space and trying to be aware of that, I have a whole bunch of gingers down here. These are Banrai Reds that are in the background. I'm getting closer, but there's nothing to see. It's just leaves. I got them planted up way too late this year. So I'm going to need to grow them out for a few months in the grow space. Normally with the curcuma, the curcuma hybrids like this one over here. Oh, so pretty. Look at those flowers. Be even prettier if I cut out the dead foliage and the dead flowers. But with these, this is sweet memory. I just let them go into their dormancy on their own. And I keep them someplace cool, dark, and dry for the winter time. And then the spring they flush out and they look great again. And even bigger, right? Because it's a corn. It gets bigger every single year. But these banrais over here, they haven't bloomed yet because they got planted up so late. And I'm thinking it would be better for next year for them to complete their growth cycle, meaning that they need to go into flower and then let them go into a dormancy. So I have to be aware of those things as far as moving plants goes, right? I'm going to need to have space for these things. I need to grow out. So maybe I won't be taking the heliconias in. I don't have to make my mind up on these things right now, but it's that time of year where the wheel is spinning and have to take these things into account. I did want to make sure to show the Joe Hoke agave. It's another Desmontiana that I got a couple weeks after I got that Galactic Traveler. And it had some burn and some crisp on it. And I told y'all, I said, hey, just wait. I'm going to pot it up, hit it with a root stimulator. And in a few weeks, maybe a couple months, it'll be looking great. And it's looking great. Got a whole bunch of new growth. So this right here is all new. These two are new. And this is just in about, what, six weeks? Not even six weeks, maybe a month since I got this one. And the variegation on it is just beautiful. It's that nice, subtle variegation. It's not the loud, yellow, stripey stuff that I just, I'm not a big fan of. Very calm. So this is going to grow up and uh, form a really nice, more of a vase shape. As far as agaves go, and that foliage will come up and drape down and be absolutely beautiful. I wanted to make sure to give that update because I was going to forget and people like the agaves. As far as down here, I don't know. There's, things have just been growing, but not a lot has changed. The Gassia palms. I feel like I give a lot of updates on these guys, but they're growing, doing great. This year has been better for them than last year. They got repotted last year. I think that has something to do with it. They still have some of their bad winter foliage on them. The only thing I don't like about the Gassias is they are slow. And that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing as far as it being a plant that you can keep for a pretty long time before they outgrow your space. Like an Alexander palm down there, that was eight or nine feet tall just several years ago, and now it's 22, 23 feet tall. It's a, just an absolute beast. Same thing with the queen palms. They quickly outgrow the home. The Gassias, they'll fit for a pretty long time, and you get a nice clear trunk on them. There aren't a lot of palms where you get a nice clear trunk on them other than you know, like the bamboo palms and things like that that should do okay inside. Uh, these, you know, they're going to want light and some warmth but as long as you keep them from the cold and don't let them stay sopping wet you treat them kind of like a spindle or a bottle palm pretty sturdy and uh, they're growing much better this year that was the whole point last year i was a little bit concerned because i only got like two fronds out of them i think that's because they were still establishing themselves into their new containers last year and then i've been doing that perfect pump fertilizer and again the fertigation with them and i've gotten a good amount of nice big green lush growth on them i'm not seeing much discoloration in there these haven't been on drip, so that's the main reason it impresses me even more. 
is they've been completely reliant on being hand watered. I planted these up with that being in mind that I may not set the drip up on these this year just because I didn't want the hoses and things running across the patio. So that's why it's mostly catharanthus and then the roeas in here, plants that can take some drought paired pretty nicely with these Gossia palms. And I should mention with the Gossia palms, I've talked about them a lot. There are a few different types and most of them are going to be kind of like what I've been talking about where they can take the heat, they want the heat and somewhat drier conditions. However, the Gossia Gomez is from more inland area of Mexico. They still like things more humid and more consistently moist. If you get a Gossia palm and you want it because of that drought tolerance thing, probably don't go with the Gomez. Uh, they're just going to want more water. Or, yeah, get the Gomez. You just have to water it more often. Otherwise, the care is pretty much the same on those. Oh, over here. Rehab palms. We call them rehabs. They were shipped with basically no roots on them. These are the Vichias right here. And I've got a new frond here. New one coming out. This has grown, I think, two new fronds. They were over in the shade garden, my rehab garden area over there where they were getting deep, deep shade. And I just moved them over here into more sun a couple of weeks ago. I let them hang out in partial sun for about three weeks before moving them over here where they're getting a lot more light. And that's been going really well. I'm not seeing any scorching. They haven't bleached out. So I'd say they were ready to get moved. Same thing with this coconut. This is actually shockingly reestablished itself faster than the Vichias have. You just never know what you're going to get with the coconuts. They're really weird palms. Typically, you should have the same growth habit out of all of them, but I have lots of coconuts out here, and I can tell you this one that was field dug and was shipped to me with barely any roots on it has reestablished itself and put out more growth than the ones like this one over here. I've only gotten two fronds, three fronds, out of this one this year. It didn't go through anything like that other than having to recover from the grow space and being over fertilized. I think the perfect palm fertilizer, I went overboard with it. This showed up about a week after I fertilized. It started to look pretty sad and upset. I gave it a heavy flush and the new stuff, the newest foliage is coming out looking a lot better. That's something to keep in mind. I've heard other people say that with that perfect palm fertilizer that you do need to be careful with smaller palm trees and uh, how much you give them. I'm gonna go very light with that fertilizer. Lespedeza, this is the time of year when it starts to shine. Although it was very weird this year, it bloomed on and off throughout the entire summer. Usually it just holds off until late August into September. And then it's just this wonderful cascade of pink flowers that are usually covered in pollinators. Look at this, just a whole wall of pink here. It's a gorgeous plant, but it takes up a lot of space. I moved this, and I think I talked about this in the last garden tour. It was over there and up against the edge of the, the wall. There's a wall here. You can't see it draped over, and it just took up too much space. So I dug it up, and I moved it a few feet back, and I swear it's still taking up just about as much space, so it's got to go next year. When it starts to come back next year, I'm going to move it down to the other side of the yard where it can grow over the wall, and it won't matter because there's no path in the way. And I might get a bush variety of Lespedeza thumbergii, that stays smaller and isn't a cascader because i do like having the cascade here it looks nice but it's just too much I'm losing all the nice clean lines out here they spend gonna have time taking care of things so that they look more tidy <laughs> surrounded by weeds over here this all just showed up in the past week it's been raining all week and the weeds have been appreciating it oh the miami planters i'm gonna miss these you know, typically when it's the time of year and the palm trees go, I might be like a little bit bummed, but not really. I, I'm more re-energized because it symbolizes the time of year. Or it's the kickoff really to the time of year when I start to do things for the second half and doing things with the evergreen planters and more things in the grow space. It's just, it's a reset from everything else I've been doing. So I don't get bummed out about it. But these over here, I'm going to miss these. These came out absolutely just, just, they're spectacular, aren't they? I don't know what to say. They're absolutely beautiful. Each one's probably put on maybe eight inches to a foot of trunk, which is what I would expect because they don't get a ton of light over here and, you know, Adonidia's like some light. But everything they're underplanted with, there's so much color. The Crossandras that are in here, I love them. With the Vinca, not Vinca, the Impatiens. What a great color pairing. You see how the Vinca started to trail? That's not a trailer, but when you plant them on the edge and you crowd them, They'll trail. They'll just grow wherever they have to grow to keep moving. They're so big and colorful. The Yang Neorigelias, 
they bounced back wonderfully. These looked like garbage when they were shipped here. They sat in the mail for several weeks and showed up just looking horrible. But I think they're looking fantastic. They've got so much color in them. Really contrasts nicely with the canary wing begonia that's in here. Lots of color on there. And then, of course, these variegated fried eggs. I think probably my favorite of the variegated colocasia has got to be the fried egg. I need, oh, need to do some pruning in here. This is putting out an all white. That's not going to do anything for the plant. You can see that one fizzled out. Get those off of there. It's not doing anything for the plant. Is my fingernail's not sharp enough? No? Okay, well, I'll come back to that with some quarters later. Overall, you get what I'm saying. So much color. I was hoping for more growth out of the fried eggs, but these were just tiny little tissue cultured things when I planted them up. And once these got up onto drip, which wasn't that long ago, they really took off. The entire containers, both of them, just really started growing once I got the drip run. It took me a while this year because I re did the whole drip, essentially, that's out here. But it's made a big difference. The hydrangeas bloomed for the first time. They've never bloomed for me. So having irrigation up here has just made a tremendous difference. Look at that. There's so much color down here. Great pairings. I really like this color combination. It's going to be hard to not repeat it next year because I like the way it looks so much this year. Does this smell good? You like sniffing the bromeliads? Gotta be careful. Careful, trouble. Those are spiky. I do like to change things up. That's what I was saying. But uh, they just came out looking so good. I don't know. I do think the Crossandras, I will probably pull these up and cut them in half, repot them, take them inside for the winter. Fridex definitely are going to come inside. The Chrysandra, maybe not, because again, it's like the Persian Shields. I can get new ones for just a few bucks. So it's like, do I want to take up the space? I just have to spend time thinking about it, all that. The Impatience out here. I love the Impatience. Simple, inexpensive, and so dramatic. These got planted up late in the year. If you don't remember, I had some family stuff, some family crisis things going on when I would normally be doing my annuals this year. So some didn't get in the ground until several weeks later than usual, but it didn't matter because they're impatient. They don't care. They're absolutely huge. There are some holes in there from when you, you know, dog toys and things like that. I actually, <laughs> as beautiful as this is, I'm kind of looking forward to cutting this back only because these have gotten so tall the sprinklers are doing nothing. There's sprinkler heads in here, but they're completely blocked by the impatient. So I've been having to hand water over here a lot. And these are big plants to be hand watering. So it will actually be nice when I can cut those back and pull them out of there, I think. I'm going to miss it. That's a bittersweet thing, right? Because it's so much color. I started with them down there around the diamond head colocasia, which is one that, well, this is probably going to be the last look at it because I need to cut this out of here. Beautiful, beautiful elephant ear, but it's, it's too big. It's got to go. It's actually, it's not the size is why it needs to go. It's that I've been seeing some spider mites in here. And we're at that time of year where I know, okay, in three weeks, four weeks, there's going to be frost. It's going to kill it back. I'd rather just cut it back with any of the color cages that are out here. If they have spider mites on them, same thing with bananas. I just cut them, get rid of them. It makes life so much easier as far as spraying goes. Just get rid of the problem plants since we're already so close to the end of the year. These are absolutely beautiful though, aren't they? The diamond heads. The only thing about it is it got so much bigger than I thought it was going to get. This spot here, I don't know, that's at least maybe 10 feet wide and they're about five and a half six feet tall which is much bigger than i thought they were supposed to get and uh, that's just it made it so that it was it was pointless planting this area up with impatience i planted them all through here all around they're in there you can kind of see highlights of them but they were ringed around this entire area and then they come through up into the planter down they go down through right here continue up this wall and go all the way up the hill back behind that miami planter over there so it was just tons, planted so many of them, and it looks really good. Love how it came out. However, I think that a lot of it's lost because that giant color cage is there. And it looks beautiful, don't get me wrong, especially when you're over here. But when you're down there, think back to the clips you just saw, or I'll just go down there, I'll show you. You can barely even see them because of that dark foliage. If it was big and lime green or something like that, it would make more of an impact. But unless you're over here, you don't really notice them, which isn't a bad thing. It's nice having really big, fun surprise plants when you're walking around. I like that, having lots of layers and lots of detail and things that all of a sudden pop out at you. But since we're at the end of the growing season and I've been having to spray it, which is just such a pointless thing to do with collocations. It's not pointless, but you know, you spray neem on one of these things and it just, bleh. it just runs right off of them. The 
foliage just repels water, which is fun when it's raining and you get to watch the water dance off. And I love seeing all the little beads of water on a collocasia leaf, but not useful <laughs> when it comes to pest management and pest control. So I gotta just get it out of there. And I also don't want to be spraying neem constantly around flowering plants. That's not great for the pollinators. So I just think it's just got to go. So last looks, probably get rid of that in the next week or so. And you just have to take it in right now because I'm over it. It's taken up too much space and it's got bugs on it. Lost an arb is the drought. It happens. Arbs just, you know, they don't like it when it's 100 degrees outside and it doesn't rain for six weeks. That is an old one too, so that's a bummer. It's going to be difficult to replant in that spot because it doesn't have the sun that it had when these were originally planted. These are huge. They're going to start to age out here in the next few years, so I do need to come up with a plan because uh, you just, it's, I don't, I'm not going to be able to buy new ones that are that big and they add a lot of privacy. So, I don't know, just to figure that out. So that kind of stinks that that's dead, but well, is what it is. I just noticed that a couple weeks ago and then it rained, so I haven't removed it yet. The gingers, the myogas, so happy. Once I got the drip set up over here, they just started growing like insanity. I just wasn't able to pull it off with hand watering and with the handheld spr not handheld sprinkler but the tripod sprinkler it just wasn't enough for him having the drip there's a drip head over there that spraying them has made all the difference and having uh some new irrigation heads put in there's a new head down here that's doing a much better job of reaching everything so a lot of the plants that have been growing all that great for the last couple of years are really starting to do more like this begonia my shoe just made a farty noise i don't know if you heard it but that was my shoe if you did hear it got some flowers on it a little bit small this is not heron's pirouette this is it's not Smooch. Smooch has shiny leaves. Who are you? Like raining kisses or something like that? I don't know. It's not that impressive anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it needs more light. So I'm going to need to move this next year. The Time Traveler Hosta, it multiplied this year after having it for, what, four or five years? Something like that. Finally put off a couple of offshoots, which is really nice. These are a pretty expensive Hosta because they do not spread very rapidly it takes years to get them to put off offshoots but it is still one of my favorites because it's just it's just a lime green leaf with that little streak in the middle it's so pretty and i haven't been talking about that one much this year so glad that i remembered it'll be more noticeable in a few weeks when all the tropicals are gone be able to stand back and look at more the perennials more closely thai constellation new leaf has some sunburn or, or heat burn really there's not much sun over here on this at all but it's a nice, nice big one. Huge variegation. I'm so happy that this has started putting out nice, big, chunky variegation. How many years have I had this plant and talked about how as far as the ties go and variegated, Monstera deliciosus have this one just, it isn't very attractive, but I still love it just because it's a Monstera and I like all the fenestration and all the holes and everything. And then it's like it hurt me and it started throwing out these awesome giant chunks on the leaves. Really happy with that. I hope it keeps doing it. It's not from anything I did. It must just be age. Oh, the hydrangeas. This isn't really the last time you'll be seeing. These will still be around for the next garden tour, but the underplantings will probably be cut back. The pack of stackies, they just look so good. I love, 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 love these containers with the sun impatience and a nice little ring around everything. And the color combo, even though, you know, pink and pink you wouldn't think looks good together. I actually really like how that looks. It looks, this is very intense on camera. Wow. It's more subtle in person. The wave, but not waves. Uh, Super Junior Vista Bubblegums did their thing. They got planted up very late. I don't think I put those in these containers until July. And I just did two in each instead of doing my normal four and then the sweet potato vines. I wanted to still be able to see the containers. And I'm glad I did that. Things look more clean and tidy that way. Had some scorch on this one. Talked about that in a few videos. I moved it to the shade when we had the really hot temperatures. I took this entire container moved it back over here where it was getting less light than this one but i guess i just did it too late my gauge was over 95 then i was going to move it into the shade and one day was 97 and then i moved it i get that was just too much i don't know the other one looks fine has some brown on it but it still has some good color on the other panicles that are on here it's starting to brown up more i swear it was looking great a few days ago like, look at that one. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. It's a beautiful hydrangea. These are strawberry vanillas. Typically have always been really great for the sun and the heat. I think they just need to be repotted. They've been in these containers too long. Perennials need to be 
refreshed every few years, so next year I'll move them into something new. Okay, the acanthus. Back to the acanthus. Actually, I could probably save this for the next garden tour. I was thinking this would be the last update with them, but acanthus can take some white frost, so they'll probably still be around in October. But here are the others. So I showed you the other two that I planted down on the north side of the yard. I have this one up here on the hill, which has just been doing great. It's not doing as much as far as the foliage is concerned, but it's the only one that's bloomed. It has some vines wrapped up in the flowers, and it's hard to see everything. It's a lovely view of the neighbor's backyard, but it's putting up a new flower spike, which I thought was interesting. I don't think I've ever had an acanthus put up a flower spike for me in September. Don't think I've ever seen that before. So maybe it's just going through something. I don't know. I've also never grown the oak leaf, though. I've grown the Summer Beauty and some of the spinosas. And I say the other one, rhubarb, I think I've grown. But uh, this is my first one with the oak leaf. And I got to say, I think it's my favorite. So here's the one that was in the five-gallon container. Definitely a huge size difference, right? That's why there was a big price difference, too, though. Here's another one that was a 2.5-gallon right there. I'm going to back up so you can see them both. So that's what I got out of the 2.5-gallon versus the 5-gallon. The ones that were in the 2.5 gallons, I think it put up more growth, but I think that's just a siding situation. This one right here has started to put up a good amount of growth, but it took it several weeks. And that's normal, right? You put a perennial in the ground, you just got to wait and give them some time. But the foliage, it's just so, look at that leaf. That's so beautiful. It's so shiny. I think what I always say is they remind me of like an off-brand thematophyllum by Panita <laughs> You get a similar vibe-ish to that, but they're cold hardy. And that's why I grow them. And I love the flowers on them. Unfortunately, the one that's flowering is one where I don't really get to see the flowers that often because I feel like I'm walking around the neighbor's backyard when I'm up there. But the rest should bloom next year. At least ones that are getting more sun. So this one's probably getting the most sun out of all of them. Maybe. Actually, it's one of the ones that's on the north and gets a good amount of sun. But I think that combined with the drip, I have a drip head running through here that's giving it a good amount of water. I think that's making a big difference. And what a difference the drip has made, period. So this entire area from here all the way over hasn't been getting irrigation for the last few years. There's a sprinkler head up here, but this pine tree trunk blocks what it does. So the head's down there. Most stuff over here doesn't get hit by the head. And there is another head down here, which is why some of the leaves on the pedicides are shredded. But it goes from right there and over because it can't, you don't want spraying into the neighbor's backyard. So there's a black line in here. It's hard to see, but I rig that up to the irrigation systems. When the irrigation runs on the other side of the yard, the drip heads go off over here. So the viburnums, like this one right here, Pragan's viburnum, actually growing this year. Last year, nothing. Year before, nothing. They just sat there. What a difference water makes. Who knew? Oh, I've been watering by hand, but like I said, it's just not the same. Getting things up or hooked up to something that has a timer on it and keeping that regular moisture and consistency makes a tremendous difference for the plants. Even this one right here, been in the ground for years. These should be at least five to six feet tall. They've barely grown, but now that there's irrigation on them, got lots of new growth. Tons of it. That's really good. I want to get this area to fill in now because now that, you know, the neighbors, they've cut down everything in their backyard. Not a fan of the view. Lovely people really like them, but I don't want to look at their fence all year. So that goes back to what I was talking about earlier about how I've been focusing this time of year on the garden, on the evergreens more looking into the second half of the year when all this colorful stuff won't be out here and I won't have giant alocasias out here to help add some privacy. So I planted a row of Hixii. These might be Hillii. I think these are hilly I use. There's three of them right here and then a gap because there's the viburnum right there and then three more right here. Those are going to go, I think, eight to ten feet on the max end with the Hillii by about three feet wide. So they have more of a columnar growth. They really look kind of weird when you plant them up on their own. They look best if you plant them in the air away where they will hedge up. And I'm just going to let those grow up to be about the same height as the fence. I'm okay with letting them, you know, not be fully grown together because I'm not trying to completely block off the neighbors. Uh, but just having something to break up what's just going to be a field of brown grass and mulch during the winter time out here. Having that pop of green is going to be really nice. And just the difference in texture between the viburnums and those views, that's going to look really nice too. It's going to be a few years, so we see much out of them, but that's okay. If you know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about these little stringy guys over here. One right there, one right there, one right there. The others you can't see, but in a month or so, whenever the frost takes back these impatiens, they'll see them very clearly, and I will be so, so, so happy that they're over there. On the note of the yews, planted a few more of those. By a few more, I mean nine. 
to get this hedge fixed up over here. So this is my backup hedge and uh, I love it. Have a little bit of die off on one of them. It wasn't the most ideal time to be planting ewes, but had to get it done. Figured they were better off in the ground than trying to keep them in the containers through the heat spell and the drought. Yeah, that coral looks great, doesn't it? It's looking better now that the irrigation's fixed up on it. So I planted nine. There were already some here. Some of them died off last winter and I added in nine more to really tighten this up. Idea here being that these ewes will eventually be, I don't know, five, six feet tall. And I'm gonna keep them at that height. And then if the laurels die, <laughs> can't imagine such a thing happening. If they do die because of a really bad winter, then there's a backup hedge here. And I'm not just gonna be left high and dry with absolutely no privacy on this side of the yard. These are more reliable. I know some look kind of junky right now, but that's because they were just planted and there's a drought and the heat and everything. In the next few years, this will fill into a nice, tidy green wall. These are great. They're so sturdy. These are the Hyxia. So the ones up there were the hilly eyes, which I said about eight to 10 feet. The Hyxia eyes can push, I believe like 10, 12 feet. There's a tag in this one, but of course it's the one that's full of spider webs. What, what do we have here? Hyxia. What do you guys say? 10 high, four feet wide. So then the hilly eyes are probably eight feet high, more on the max and four feet wide. The hilly eyes stay smaller. But uh, yeah, whole point there is I really like the way that hedge is starting to fill out. It's gonna take some time, but eventually it's gonna be really nice to look at from the other side of the yard. And it just makes me feel better <laughs> knowing that there's a backup in place in case that hedge dies back. Oh, Pharaoh's dream. Uh, there's not much to say about it other than it's just beautiful. Isn't that a beautiful leaf? This one's a lot smaller than the other one. So this is the Pharaoh's Dream Colocasia. Those are from Brian's Botanicals. I got these in the springtime. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. They sent me two. One's down there. Other one's over here. This one over here has suffered. This is difficult. This is a tricky spot to walk in. Uh, the heat and the drought, this corner gets really, really hot. So it had some dieback. You could call it dieback. Some of the leaves just burnt up a little bit on them. But now that things have gotten more mild, it seems to be happy. And the variegation, every single new leaf it puts out is more and more intense. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? The purpley red in the middle. And it's almost like someone painted the rest of it with a highlighter. And they have a really cool cup-shaped leaf that sticks up, you know, like so. Very similar to the bikini teenies over here, but I think much more colorful and beautiful. Water hits them. They fill up with water. They dump it out. So it's a fun one to have around and supposed to be pretty cold hardy which I would imagine it probably is, because when I look at this, and then I look at those, the Bikini Teenies, which are these right here, very similar, right? There's a Bikini Teeny that's been cooked by the drought in the sun. Very similar, right? So it's probably got Bikini Teeny DNA in there, and the Bikini Teeny is very cold hardy. I was hoping to get a little bit more growth out of these this year, but, you know, lack of rain, just not their jam. Watered them as much as I could, but only so much you can do. Looks like there's another new leaf coming up over here. Oh, that's gonna be a pretty one too. Look at all the color in there. Love it. I think I rave about these every single garden tour. And it's fun because you get to see something new with them every garden tour because the variegation is getting more and more intense as they get bigger. I'm hoping that these will have established themselves well enough this year to get going faster and reach a big size and have the variegation on them sooner next year instead of having to wait until like August to get to see the really cool leaves. That's just one of those things where it's gonna take time, right? Have to grow them out for a couple of years to really get to know them. But you can see, look at how great the variegation is gonna be on that one. Because when they're still opening up, the variegation is not as strong as it's going to be when they're fully open. And that's got some crazy color in it. I cannot think of anything that's cold hardy to zone six that has that kind of an intense tropical look to it. Just imagine a few years when this has established itself even more and it's probably three times the size or so as far as spreading goes, that vibrance, that veining, it looks a lot like a gloriosum. I think I've talked about that. It reminds me of a gloriosum, but uh, a, a gloriosum and a colocasia had a baby. So I feel like you're getting with those. Oh, Pindo. I forget to talk about this one every single garden tour. It's been loving life this year. I went ahead and I just stuck it on the patio and haven't watered it, and it's been doing great. <laughs> I uh, always have an issue with these getting crown rot because they end up getting situated someplace where a sprinkler is hitting them and water collects in the middle. It's at its stupid size. It gets a few feet taller, that won't be an issue. So every year I end up having to come back crown rot with it. And this year I said, no, I'm just going to put it someplace where it's going to get some shade because it's still a smaller palm and just have to remember to water it by hand. So it gets hand watered about three times a week with the, you know, the fertilizer water and it's putting out 
exactly what I want it to put out, not this long, stringy, stupid stuff that you get when they're not getting enough light and proper watering, getting that nice, round, curved, stiff foliage, and it's starting to blue up, getting some nice blue tones in there. Love a boutique. This is, this is a palm tree. It should be so much bigger than this by now, but it's just, it's been through it, doing that crown rod every year. I think next year it'll get a lot bigger. They grow so much faster. If you ever get a pendu palm, just put them in the ground. They grow so, so, so much faster in the ground in a container. Oh my gosh, they're like snails. I tell you to put them in the ground when there's no way in heck I would put one in the ground. I did it for many years. They require so much protection from the cold here in 6B, 7A. And uh, it's just one ice storm and power outage and boom, the whole thing's dead in all those years of hard work down the drain. That's why I have mine in the container. It's just not worth it to me to go through that all again. I was so heartbroken when my last one died. I'd had it in the ground for like five or six years. And it was probably, I don't know, eight to 10 feet tall at that point. And, you know, overwintering, it's not like with the windmill palms where you can just, you know, mulch them, maybe wrap some lights around them and wrap them up. With the Pendu, just, I would build a greenhouse around them every winter, essentially. It's a lot of work and money and time, and it's just uh, too unpredictable. So I don't do that anymore. Maybe if I had a generator, then I probably would, but I don't. So that's hence why it's in a container. Oof, need to give this one a clean up. So there are some things that I've really just kind of let go because they were chores that I didn't want to do out here in the heat because, you know, some plants just wouldn't respond well to it. This asplenium here really could use a cleanup and I just didn't want to mess with it. Really, it could use it a repot. So this is a variegated one. I've had this for a long time. It's been in a fair amount of videos, at least whenever it's been repotted and when I got it. Look at those leaves. Aren't they absolutely beautiful? It's been doing great out here this year and I grew it differently than I do most years. Most years, I make sure to set this by this fountain in a spot where it gets kind of a constant dribble from the water. And uh, it was growing really well when I did it that way. This year, I just set it down a few feet out and gave it some more light, which I was, wasn't sure about doing, but it did so well in the grow space last year in the spot I put it in. And that spot was on one of the bottom shelves, which are shallow shelves. The lights are only maybe a foot above the plants. And that spot is mostly for smaller plant seedlings and whatnots. And it just, it seemed to really enjoy it. Even though in the past, outside, when it gets a good amount of sun, it would just fry and die. I really liked being really close to the grow lights. And that's, you know, grow lights and sunlight, not the same deal. But I tried it in that spot so it was getting filtered light in the afternoon instead of just shade. And uh, it's done well, but it needs to be cleaned up. And I think it's time to repot this thing. I do like the pot that it's in. I think it's a very pretty container. It's been in there for maybe three years now. So I'm looking this thinking... Yeah, come in here, cut all this dead stuff out. I could probably pull off one more winter in this container, and it should be okay, because it's just not the ideal time for repotting. I prefer to do these things in the spring, so that they have all season outside to reestablish themselves. That's something to think about, and I've talked about several things fairly similar to that. But I thought I should show it, because you can see where there were times where it started to revert, and then I just cut it back and got some nice new variegated foliage out of it. There was some controversy around this one around the time I got it from people saying that they were chemically induced and that it's not real variegation. I was like, I disagree because it, if it was chemically induced, that variegation would have been gone a long time ago. I've had this for how four or five years, probably maybe longer than that. And it's still putting out variegation. So I'm going to say that that's not chemically induced. And uh, I do think it would be happier in a bigger pot though probably put on some more size. I don't know, it's an epiphyte though. So the pot doesn't really matter, it's really just more something to hold it in place. But after so many years, you have to worry about the potting media becoming mucky and holding on to too much moisture. It feels just about right though. It still feels airy and chunky. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here and thought I'd let y'all see it because I always forget to update with the variegated bird's nest fern. Look at those leaves. Such a pretty plant. Okay, that's enough. Those are all the updates I can think of. It's the last look at everything. Next garden tour, things will probably be looking pretty different out here. Uh, not bad, just different, right? May, well, it might be bad, who knows? Who knows what October is going to bring? If we have a few hard frosts, things are going to be looking pretty intense out here. But uh, this is kind of the 2024 summer wrap up, even though it's now fall. You get my point though, right? Everything that was done over the summer 
summer annuals and everything. This is it. Always sad to have the season come to an end, but there's the second half of the year, the off season. There's gonna be plenty to do. Lots of color. I really like how everything came out this year. The color palette with the three different sun patients. The sweet potato vines I go back and forth on, like I like them, but they're also pretty wild and messy. Didn't get a ton of growth out of the bananas, but I'm not surprised by that because the irrigation didn't really get fixed up until midsummer, and they like a ton of water. So as soon as that irrigation got fixed, that they started exploding in growth. So there's always next year to really be more on top of fertilizing, maybe run drip heads directly to them like I used to do, which is when they got absolutely massive. Didn't do that this year. I just let them do their thing. The baju bananas are so sturdy. It's, it's just hard to motivate myself sometimes to go to all the extra trouble to get them to do the extra growing when I know that I can basically just leave them alone and they'll be fine. But making that extra effort really does matter, right? I don't have to mulch them where I live. They'll die down to the ground and come back just fine with our winters here. But by putting two or three feet of mulch in there, you help preserve two or three feet of pseudostem and then they're two to three feet taller at the beginning of the growing season, you end up with bigger plants. But I don't have to do that, but I choose to. And I'm just now remembering that I'm only a few weeks away from having to go and buy like 70 bags of mulch. Oh, geez. The one thing I don't like about this time of year is all the mulching. Oh, the, these planters, they came out really nicely too. This ginger I talked about in the last garden tour, it's really bizarrely massive leaves on it. I am going to try and get this inside and overwinter just because it's so unique for a Zarembit alpinia. I never see them with leaves this big when they're this squat really big established plants, I'll see them with leaves that big, but this is just, it's like 30 inches tall, and look at how fat and chonky it is. I really, really like that one. I've grown a lot of Zarembuts, and that one specifically is, it's a keeper, I think, so I want to make sure to dig that up and move it in, and yeah, just try and take it all in the next couple weeks and enjoy the fruits of the labor. Hope y'all are doing the same. This is that time of year where you can actually sit back and relax for a couple weeks and just enjoy everything because there's not much point in planting new things right now. It's in a transitional period. Not really smart to repot right now unless it's absolutely necessary. It's just a uh, time to relax and enjoy it all and watch things grow. Definitely no point in fertilizing, not for the most part. For things that are going to the grow space, I'll keep fertilizing them. The stuff that goes off to storage, I'll give them a slow release before they leave, but uh, it's not like I've been doing during the summer where I'm making sure that they're getting fertilizer with every single watering. The day lengths are shorter, so there's just not really much of a point unless it's warm and I have the plants moved into full sun and there's just not a lot of sun out here this time of year. The angle is shifted, so there's just, there's so much shade. Anyways, comment down, oh, this, I forgot to talk about the spindle palm. Well, it's not going anywhere. We'll talk about that later. It's done some growing. That's all you need to know. It's growing and just looking cute. Cute, chunky little spindle palm. As I was saying, everybody's doing well. and a great day, a great life, and everything's just going absolutely beautifully. I thought that was going to look so much prettier when I started to zoom in on it. Let's try that again. Hope everybody's doing well. having a great day, a great life, and everything's just going absolutely beautifully for you. Comment down below. Say hi. What's going on in your gardens? End of summer, right? It's officially fall at this point. Any changes that you're making? What you're doing to prep your houseplants to move inside? I had a video I was going to make about houseplants you can leave outside, and I never did it. And I, well, uh, I'll just have to wait. <laughs> Oops! There are some houseplants that are surprisingly cold hardy, but I think it's better to put them in the ground in the springtime anyways. Yeah, like I said, comment down below. Just love talking to everybody, and hope y'all enjoyed this spot. I should have focused more on this spot. I really like how these layers came out right here with the orchid, and then the nice green with the alocasia, and the heliconias in the background when you're standing over here sitting down in the chairs. Look at the view. Everything just came out so nicely this year. Right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.